Hello, welcome everybody. We are here with a wonderful guest today, Patty Height. Uh, the Lord has used her in amazing ways to educate the church, to share the truth of the Lord, to share about her own journey of freedom in Christ. Um, Patty, I'd like to tell our viewers a little bit about how we met. Um, five years ago now, uh, the Lord had me do a story for Calvary Chapel Magazine on Patty, on her testimony. And I remember I had seen her, I had glimpsed her through the crowd at a pastor's wives conference. Um, and she asked for prayer. She felt she had this burden on her heart to start reaching out to people in the LGBT community and to reach out to churches to educate us about how to reach uh, these people. And so it was less than a year later, I was on the phone with her and I said, so Patty, tell me, how did the Lord save you? How did you find Christ? And her story was so beautiful. And I just saw Jesus's hand of just reaching out to her in the most gentle way. And I also saw her response. And in my own life as a Christian, I just, I'm always touched by just those steps of obedience, trusting the Lord and taking each step of obedience and how that on the other side of that is freedom. And I've heard Patty's testimony several times and I always come away with that. Just her just total trust and taking those steps of faith with Christ and how he's worked through her. So. So Patty, I remember in that story, um, we started that story with you at the bedside of your brother and he had cancer, I believe, and he was, he was dying. Um, yeah, but yeah. at some point in his illness, an, a Christian was coming to read the Bible to him on a regular basis. And at some point in his illness, he accepted Christ and you were there at the bedside, you kind of watching him. Can you take us back to how the Lord used that? And, and how he brought you to himself? Yes, yes. Our God is so mighty to save. And so I just want to say hi to everyone. It's so good to see you, Christmas. Oh, I squeeze you. I hug you real big right now. <laughs> but um, yeah, that was some years ago. Actually, I think the conference that I stood up at was actually six years ago. And then we, maybe we did that article a little while after that. And um, that same conference had to be, you know, postponed this year. But uh, we know that the Lord will reunite us again, if not here at another conference in the clouds with Jesus at the, sh the shout of an archangel and at the trump of God, we will be together in the clouds with Jesus. Whether we go see him first through our own um, falling asleep in Christ or whether he comes while we are still those who here remain, We'll see each other at the cloud. So maybe the next time I see you, we'll be at, I don't know, 35, 40,000 feet. I don't know, maybe. <laughs> I don't know, where Jesus come. But yeah, so, so actually um, speaking, I'm going to take you just a tiny step uh, back further than when my brother was diagnosed with lung cancer and, you know, saying that we're going to meet the Lord in the air, in the clouds. I spent 25 years um, in a career as a flight attendant. So just prior to my brother being diagnosed with lung cancer, 9-11 happened. And I live, uh, my home where I was living with my girlfriend at the time, happened to be like maybe anywhere from 12 to 15 miles um, as a crow flies from the Twin Towers. Um, and we were both flight attendants at the time and both happened to have that day off and learned as we all did of what was happening to our country being attacked and the, you know the twin towers being attacked with the very uh, vehicle so to speak that was my place of work you know my office wow. was on a metal tube at 35 40,000 feet in the air so it was very scary um to experience that being so close uh you know mileage wise i could smell the smoke um but also being a flight attendant which the very, very, very first victims of 9-11 were the flight attendants when they got their throat slit with those box cutters. So it was very, very scary. My girlfriend and I didn't know what to do. We didn't know who to turn to because we didn't know the Lord, yet I, I knew deep inside me somehow I needed to involve 
God somehow, but I didn't know which God. Was it the God that I believed in reincarnation? Was it the God that I believed in was Mother Nature? The God I believed was an alien? I mean, I believed everything because I was always searching for something more than myself. Even though my whole life was wrapped up in self, I still had a longing to look outside of self for that. So I remember like maybe two, three days after 9-11 being at the, at the lesbian bar down the street from us and it was last call, you know, and so I got my last Miller Lite, my last shot of Jägermeister and because the and knowing that I wanted to involve God somehow, the only thing I could think of to do was to get my crew, all my girls together and sing God Bless America before we did our last shot. Um, before leaving the bar. So even there, there was a sense and a longing to find out if there was a God beyond the one that I had made up myself. Changed every year or two with whatever new spiritual book I was reading. So then just a couple months after that, um, my brother was diagnosed with lung cancer. And, you know, we weren't raised in a sense in a Christian home. Um, we knew God in a sense, because, you know, sometimes on Christmas or Easter, we would go to church and we watched, um, what was that Charlton Heston movie, uh, The Ten Commandments <laughs> every year. So that's as far as our, our Christianity went. But as I was going to visit my brother during his illness, he started telling me about the man that lived across the street from him, Bruce Norgwall, um, and how he would come home from work and read, grab his Bible and go read the Bible to my brother, uh, particularly the Gospels, and introduced Jesus to my brother, Larry. And so, you know, Larry began telling me about about Bruce. And I was I was intrigued by the change in my brother because he's like, I believe now, Patty, I believe. And so while I was so excited that I saw this huge change in my brother, there was a little bit of fear in me as well, because I was like, oh, but yay. Oh, wait a minute, is he going to be like those other Christians that I've seen when I go to the pride parades and they're holding up signs that say things like God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, or homosexuals will burn in hell and God hates fags and scripture verses like LEV 1822, you know, on a piece of cardboard with like a gnarly, like angry face on it, uh, you know, like before emojis were emojis. And so, and so uh, that that uh, that confusion within my heart over over my brother because I saw a change in him, like this this guy. I mean, he, we were so much alike. We we cursed alike, alike. We did drugs alike. We dated women alike. I mean, it was we were very much alike. And so to see him not cursing and. Um, you know, holding a Bible in his hand, like it eventually it became an oxygen tank in one hand and like the Bible in the other hand. So, so this change in, intrigued me. And so, um, you know, he started telling me about heaven and all this stuff. And like, we never had conversations about that. It was very worldly conversations that we'd had before. And then on October 22nd of 2002, um, as I was holding my brother's hand in the hospital, I watched him take his last breath. So with my brother, who I loved so much, um, dying right in front of me, everything came to a grinding halt. I couldn't, I couldn't handle that fear and confusion like I did with 9-11. I couldn't go to the bar and do another shot and sing God Bless America with this one. It was too personal. It was too deep. Um, and it, it instantly made me think that I was now going to die as well. And with that thought, I started thinking, it wasn't comfortable thinking, well, if I die, I'm going to be reincarnated into something. Or if I die, I'll just become part of the mother nature thing. Or if I die, some alien is going to come and take me away. Like all these crazy things that I had believed before. Something had switched. I knew that if I died now, I would go to hell. I just knew it. I don't know how to explain it, Christmas. But contemplating, well, what causes someone to go to hell? You know, what is it? Because I didn't know. Um, and I had had a conversation with my brother before he died saying that he had that conversation with Bruce and asked Bruce something to the effect of, hey, my, my sister and her girlfriend say they believe in God, so they're going to go to heaven too, right? And this lovely, lovely man said, well, Larry, um, 
if they truly are saved and they are gods and they believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, they have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of them. And if the Holy Spirit is dwelling inside of them, the Holy Spirit um, points us to truth, thus convicting us of sin. And the Holy Spirit will tell them that the way they're living is outside of God's design, therefore sinful, you know, missing the mark. And the Holy Spirit will tell them that God has something different for them. Um, but if they don't believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, um, then no, they're not going to go to heaven, but it doesn't have anything to do with being gay. It has everything to do with believing in Jesus Christ or not. And then he's like, and again, once you believe in Jesus, you become indwelt with the Holy Spirit who shows you truth. And so my brother told me that in his way. It wasn't quite that articulate because I don't know how to talk without Christianese now but something to that effect. And, and so that, that moved me so much so that just a f maybe four or five weeks after that, this question had been rolling through my heart and through my mind. But at one point I couldn't not express this question to my girlfriend anymore. So we were laying in bed one day and I rolled over and just looked her in the eye and took the biggest step of faith. And to that point in my life I had ever taken. And I just said to her, you know, babe, do you think the way we're living is wrong? And her eyes got huge. So instantly, of course, I thought, well, that's the stupidest thing I've ever done in my life. I love her. And she looks at me and she's like, I can't believe you just asked me that. I was literally just getting ready to ask you the same thing. So now we, Christmas, we know that's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wasn't afraid to come, you know, all up inside our lesbian bedroom that day. There's nowhere we can flee from God's presence. You know, and, and so, um, you know, we just decided to get down on our knees and just pray and ask God if he was real. And if the way we were living was wrong, if he would please show us. And so I we grabbed a Bible, which we had, you know, we had to go find it and fish it out of boxes and stuff. But we had one. And so we're flipping through. And as God would have it, I got frustrated because I got frustrated really easy. I'm like, this is ridiculous. Let's just start reading here. And it happened to to, you know, we stopped flipping. Uh, when the book was opened up to uh, the book of Leviticus, which is about like the Levitical law, uh, Leviticus chapter 18. And then our eyes fell on verse 22, which says, a man shall not lie with a male as he does with a woman. It is an abomination. And so our hearts started beating. I didn't know. And now I call it the Holy Spirit heartbeat. But, you know, our hearts started beating. We're like, could this be? Could God be real? And could he really just answer us? And so after about a week, my girlfriend comes home and said she flew with a Christian. So she asked this Christian woman if it says anywhere in the Bible about women being together. And this lady told told her that we should read Romans chapter one. And when we did, when we got to verses 26 and 27, there is where we read about women being together as well as men being together um, is is an error of, of God's word and that there was penalty with that. And so. We laid it all down then and looked for a church and found Calvary Chapel, Old Bridge, and um, listened to a pastor named Lloyd Pulley in the beginning of January 2003. And I'm still listening to Pastor Lloyd Pulley. He's still my pastor 17 and a half years later. And that's where I heard the word of truth for the first time in my life. That's where I heard worship music for the first time in my life. And it the truth. The truth that I heard in the music and the truth that I heard from the word of God when it was open and expounded upon verse by verse um, ripped my heart wide open so that I could I could see God for who he was real and a God who loved me. And that changed my life forever. And so my girlfriend and I got saved the same day, January 19th, 2003. We walked in as leftist sisters never to even hold each other's hand again, let alone be in any type intimate relationship. And he's been working in both of us ever since, growing us, sanctifying us. She's a missionary that I can't talk about because she's enters into very different, I mean, a dangerous part of the world, doing some very dangerous work, but um, loves it. Uh, right from the beginning, everyone kind of pegged her as, as a missionary. Never pegged me doing this, but... <laughs> But here I am, and it was through um, through 
knowing that the Lord loved me and just digging into the word of God, like I devoured the word of God and actually wanting to be obedient to the things that he was calling me to and to the things that I was learning in his word, which is amazing because that was the epitome of disobedience before. Like if you told me to go left, I'd go right just, just to, to do it a different way. And so he gave me the knowledge of what obedience was and then the desire to be obedient, the strength to be obedient. And then when I was, he blessed me. So he did it all. And yet I'm the one that still got the blessings. That's who our God is. Awesome. And he's still using you and doing more things and more things. And um, we were just talking before we started recording. And I think in the last six years, you've been to maybe a hundred different churches, conferences, even a college campus. Mm -hmm. sharing about um, how people can reach out to the LGBT community and also just sharing your powerful testimony, which I love to hear those, you know, we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to tell the listeners that we will be taking some questions. So if you have some questions for Patty, you can put those in the comments. And uh, as we have time, um, uh, we will answer them at the end. Um, and we do ask that you would share and like this video, share it with your friends, share it with anybody, share it with your pastors, share it with, uh, so the first thing we're going to talk about is how can the church reach the LGBT community? Then we're going to talk about helping young people. So we'll, we'll uh, frame those questions a little more specifically. And then finally, we're going to talk about Patty's website, which is a wonderful resource for anybody, I think, um, because we all know someone uh, who is struggling or who might have a family member who is struggling. And it's our responsibility as the, the church to reach out in love. So Patty, how can the church reach the LGBT community? Well, I love the fact that the church mostly wants to reach the LGBT community because it hasn't always been like that. But I love how our God works because God works everything out for the good, right? Like everything out for the good. That's why we worship him and praise him for everything and in everything. Um, but 20, 25, let's just say 40 years ago, the church wasn't asking questions like this. The church would have, even though we didn't have a venue like Facebook, the church never would have sat down and said, how can we reach the LGBT community? They would have just continued in the, uh, the commentary of these are sick, gross, disgusting people, stay away from them. So I think the reason we're talking about it now is because we're seeing um, more commentary from the LGBT community on who they are and, you know, love is love and meet us where we are and, and all of that. So um, people can be upset by that, but we can trust God in all things because he's using that and, and because of that, there are thousands of people coming out of the, of the gay lifestyle or, or, or understanding their gender and being more comfortable in their God-given born gender uh, because the church is loving better. The church in times past, I, I call them, and I got this from my friend Carol, I call them truth bombs. It's like someone will just throw out this truth it, it's a bomb and it blows up near the person that they're wanting this truth to, to go to. And, you know, they're, they're dismembered by this church. And then the, you know, the Christian is walking away going, well, you know, at least I told you, told you the truth. And maybe you won't go to hell now. You know, maybe you'll believe in God. If I just tell you that homosexuality is an abomination, according to God. Well, that's, that's not what I see the heart of, of Jesus being. Um, we, are truth givers and we can never ever ever compromise the truth but jesus always brought truth in with grace sometimes he threw a truth truth bomb here and there but it was usually at the pharisees <laughs> if you want to read about that you can go to matthew chapter 24 or in other parts of the gospel as well but um so so yes we're asking how can we now but we can also ask why are we to share the gospel with the LGBT community and both how and why I, I can find in the same verse. Um, my words always fail. So I like to try to answer with 
um, because God's word will never fail and God's word is eternal and forever. So in, in 2 Timothy uh, 2 verses 24 through 26, I think is the how and the why. And it starts off with the how. So 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 26. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. So there's the how. And now here's the why. If God perhaps will grant them repentance, that they so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses. Now listen to this, that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil having been taken captive by him to do his will. And that's exactly what happened to me when I was younger. I was taken captive by the devil, by the enemy, by deception, because the devil is the father of all lies, taken captive by him because of my circumstances. But the enemy didn't say, oh, look at this poor little girl who's gender confused. I'm, I'm really going to make her think she's a boy. Oh, look at this young child who's been sexually abused. Oh, look at this young child who's watching a, a distorted um, relationship, a distorted mother-father relationship and is becoming a very detached from femininity because of it. You know, look at this poor girl who, who started drugs and alcohol at 12 years old. Look at this poor young lady who kind of still identifies in the masculine, but wants to fit into the societal expectations of the 19, late 1970s and early, early 1980s. So she's going to try to, she's going to get married to make it all go away. Oh, but look, her husband physically abuses her. So now she's really going to hate men even more. I, it wasn't like, wasn't like the enemy of my soul was saying, oh, she's, she's gone through too much. I'm just going to leave this one alone. He was drooling to get his quote unquote fangs in me and continue to lead me down that path of deception, not knowing it was deception. I didn't, I wasn't thinking when I was, you know, enjoying my life um, as a, you know, gender non-conformed gay person, you know, when I'm playing all the sports I ever wanted to play, I'm popular now for the first time in my life when I came out because I became the it girl when I started identifying as gay and I had the girl, all the girlfriends I wanted. I had all the one night stands I wanted. I even ended up with the relationship that I wanted thinking I was going to spend the rest of my life with, with one woman. I wasn't thinking that that all came to me because of deception. I was thinking all of that came to me because that's how I was born and that's who I was. And that's what deception does to us. It deceives us. It wouldn't be deception if it wasn't deceiving. And that's who the enemy is. He's the father of lies, the fathers of deception. So we have to point people to the truth in humility, with compassion. Even Jesus, when we read in, in the Gospel of John, John chapter 1 um, I think it's verse 14 talking about Jesus, you know, being the word of God. It says he was filled with both grace and truth. And I love that it's in that order filled with grace and truth, because I believe if we don't come in with grace first, nobody's going to even hear the truth. And then we'll just be back to throwing truth bombs again. You know, and I, I, I haven't seen anyone in the church when someone says, you know, hey, raise your hand how you got saved and then be like, well, I can't raise my hand because that's the limb I lost hit with that truth bomb and got saved. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's it's through re we're relational people. We really know how relational we are now that we don't have the chance to be in relational relationships with people in the sense of, of touching and, and holding. And so if we know people are relational, then ought we not to have relational relationships with people that might be different than still living in their sin, even those not even in the LGBT community, but our coworkers at work that we know some dude's having an affair on his wife or some guy's always angry or cursing or, you know, we see him gambling in, you know, on his lunch break or whatever. Compassion is compassion and people are people, whether you're gay or straight, and there's really only two types of people, those who are living under Adam and those who are living in Christ. And that's it. You know, and, and so we're called we're called to be truth bearers with compassion and grace, just like like Jesus was. So you might ask, you might ask, 
how do you do that? Um, well, I don't know. It's it's different for every situation. It's different for school students. It's different for when it's your child. It's different than when it's your parent. I know people who have parents that left their families to come out as trans. Um, and, you know, I can, when we get to that part of our time together today, I'll point you to some of those resources on, on my website. But you know what? You have to sit and pray and ask the Lord, God, you know how to reach this particular yeah. person. So whenever I get ready to talk to someone, I'm always asking, God, will you give me every spiritual gift needed for this person and even just this conversation that I'm having with them? Because we might be ministering to the same person over and over, but each conversation, the Lord might want to impart to us a different spiritual gift, it might be wisdom, it might be knowledge. You know, it, it might be helps. Help your LGBT neighbor. When you see somebody you know, you're moving in or they're moving in on your street, maybe, a, you know, a, a lesbian couple or whatever. Um, they're probably going to have pets. <laughs> That's an insider joke. Um, sorry, not on the inside anymore. Um, oh, my goodness. Why do you let me talk Christmas? <laughs> anyway, um, you know, someone's going to need to walk their dogs if they're away at work or if they go on vacation. They might have kids. Someone's going to need to bring in their mail or water their plants you volunteer to do that you invite them over to your house when you have a barbecue you know and, and invite them to church don't be afraid to invite them to church and and they're going to say what type of church is it and you just say uh, most of us are you know it's calvary chapel magazine so most of us are probably calvary people um, but whatever church you go to they're going to say what's your church like and then they're going to say does your church accept gay people or accept trans people and then you can just ask questions what do you mean by accept and let them answer and that's how you know the lord has shown me through the years to, to ask trans to listen to people and then ask questions but um you know ask what do you mean by accept and let them explain that and then say you know they'll probably say something you know well will they let us in as a couple course you know everyone comes in and then explain the reason i go to church the reason i initially went to church is to find out who god was and then when he revealed himself to me if that's how your story plays out then when he revealed himself to me he showed me all the things that i need to surrender to him and then you share your testimony you know i had to surrender my anger i had to surrender you know my my porn addiction i had to surrender this and then be you know don't be afraid god's going to show you the things that you have to surrender but you know it wasn't that hard getting rid of my anger. It wasn't that much to surrender my, you know, coffee addiction or whatever it is. But don't make it about their sexuality. Don't make it about their sexuality. Make it about Jesus Christ. Because, again, there's only two people, those who know the Lord and, the, and those who don't. It's not gay and straight. It's, it's saved or, or unsaved. I think there's a lot to what you said about don't make those initial conversations about their sexuality. I mean, that's just like putting a wall up immediately, isn't it? Before you've mm -hmm. shown them love, before you've taken the time to build up a relationship, um, you wouldn't do that with any other kind of sin. You know, you would go to a drug there's addict, so many say, you know, drug addicts can't go to heaven. There's the good news. <laughs> you know? And I share this and it, this might be a crude way to do it, but well i'm a new yorker i'm from jersey what do you want i used to say sarcasm is my love language but i'm really trying to get away from that <laughs> i've been in california so long now i'm like oh my gosh i'm losing my sarcasm everyone's so nice out here and it's so sunny anyways <laughs> but i'll tell people you know when people will say well how do i share the gospel with my gay co-worker and then i'll ask them well well what do you want to tell them and at least 80 percent of the time they'll say well you know i want to tell them what the bible says about homosexuality and i'm like well then you're not sharing the gospel with them you're sharing you know not even the law but you know martin luther put it this way the, the law discovers the disease the gospel gives the remedy so don't point to the disease so to speak point to the remedy to jesus so i'll use an example i'm like well if you have a you know, a 450 pound 
coworker and you know that they're so unhealthy because of their size and you're so concerned for them because you feel like they're going to have a heart attack at 35 years old just because they're so unhealthy and you're doing this out of love would you bring them a book that a diet book that says lose weight and then just be like you know susie i love you so much but you are like way overweight the bible says that that's not right um here's this book on how to have a diet and and stop with the diet cokes and um i'm gonna go walk with you every day at lunch so jesus really loves you i mean we wouldn't do that you know and 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 so we would point to people about the gospel and then pray and ask the Lord to minister to the part of that person that is so broken that whatever point it started for them, they started using food as a way of protection or healing for them because we're all broken in one way or another and, and we all have pain. And as my, my friend, my sister says, uh, I learned this from her, pain always, always demands a response. Pain always demands a response. So in the fifth if I'm walking through my house and my shoulder hits that corner piece and it's just like the shoulder hits it and, and it's like, ow, immediately we say, ow, but then we take our hand and we cover it because it hurts. So we hit our shoulder, it hurts, we go, ow. And so that's the initial response to pain. Now, emotionally, when our heart is in pain, we cover it initially and, and quickly as well. So my And it's gonna it's gonna see and manifest itself in different ways. And some people it's sexually, and some people it's under eating or overeating, and, and some people it's having sex with everything and everyone that moves, and some people it's it's porn. Some people I still gotta lay my chocolate addiction before the Lord because sometimes when I get upset, I go straight to chocolate, you know, and instead of being like, okay, Lord, why am I yay, chocolate? Why am I upset today? So, so if, if we hit that shoulder, we're going to eventually have to remove our hand to see if it's bleeding and then tend to it to, to fix the wound. So the Lord wants us to remove our hand from our heart where we're covering those wounds so he can get in and clean that wound out, which hurts like crazy, but you have to clean out the wound for the healing to come. And when we meet with people in, in intimate ways, we can find out where their brokenness is because, because homosexuality or heterosexuality where you're just flagrantly having sex um, or not every homosexual relationship is just about the sex my I was in them you know the one night stands were I don't even know if those were about sex but my friends were about intimate intimacy I needed to be loved the right way because I was loved my whole life but there was such a deeper brokenness in there that that the Lord wanted to address. So so get intimate with people, get to know them because they're worth it. These people, whoever these people are, gay, straight, man, male, female, whatever culture they're from, Muslim, um, heart, I can't even think of any other religions, but know them and listen love them right where they are whether they ever come to know the gospel or not of course we're going to pray that they do that is that is the prayer of our heart and the more we get to know them intimately and personally the more we can pray for them personally but even if we we look at an account of jesus ministering or talking to someone that walked away from him is in mark chapter 10 um, verses 17 through the 20 22 where he counsels the rich young ruler. So this rich dude comes up to Jesus and he's like basically asking, I have to do have eternal life. And Jesus says to him, you know, talks about some of the commandments, you know, don't commit adultery, don't murder, don't bear false witness, honor your father and your mother. And this rich, rich dude's like, yeah, yeah, I've done that, thinking that he has, not knowing that he hasn't, like many of us. Well, I'm a good person. But then um, in verse 21, it says, then Jesus looking at him, looking at him, loved him and said to him, one thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven and, and take up your cross and follow me. But the rich young ruler was sad hearing this and went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. 
So what Jesus was asking him to do was too hard for him. Not everyone that Jesus calls or woos to himself or happens to come run into walking down the road, not everyone's going to be a Christ follower. But Jesus still looked at him, engaged with him, and loved him. And that love, I looked it up, that is agape love. So Christ walk away anyways. And so I want you, church, can you do that? Will you take the time to spend with someone and pour into someone just because they're worth it? They're worth it. All right, one more thing. I know uh, you probably have lots of things to say, but uh, if I may just take one more second, Christmas. Thank you for bearing with me. So we know um, also in, in Luke chapter 15, um, it's, it's Jesus is giving a parable about the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. So, um, but before Jesus goes into the parable, um, we read text in verse one and two of Luke 15. It says, then all the tax collectors drew near to him, drew near to Jesus to hear him. Why in the world would sinners and tax collectors draw near to Jesus to hear him? Because he drew near to them. He drew near to them. And you can read an account of that. Um, what I believe they're talking about in Matthew chapter 9, verses um, 9 through 13, is just talking about when Jesus kind of, you know, met Matthew or, or saw Levi, Matthew, and he just like, follow me. And so Matthew did. And then it says in verse 10, now it happened as Jesus sat at the table in the house that behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with Jesus and his disciples. So not only did Jesus go and minister to Matthew, thus all of Matthew's friends that were still in a sinful state or sinful place, uh, unredeemed at that point, Jesus called his disciples to come with him. If Jesus didn't want us as his disciples to be sitting with tax collectors and sinners, he would have probably given us a different example. He'd be like, okay, guys, go I'm eating here. You guys go on. Go ahead. Get yourself something to eat someplace else. I'm going to be eating with Matthew and these people. They're sinners, so you, you better not be with them. But, you know, I'm the son of God, so I can handle sinners. Now you, you go your way. No. He brought them in there with them. And then back in Luke 15, verse 2, it says, And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So I ask people, do you want to be a verse 1 person? or a verse two person out of Luke, Luke 15. Do you wanna hear Jesus or do you wanna rebuke Jesus? Because people will say, people have out of context said, well, the Bible says that we're not even supposed to eat with people like that, which is so out of context. So make sure when you, when you live by scripture or quote a scripture, read the whole chapter so you know the context of what you're talking about. Some of the things I'm hearing you say are to build that relationship with a person to show the love of God. Um, and because they're worthy. Yeah, because they're so loved by God. They're made by God. They're loved by God. Jesus has already paid for their sin, right? He paid for the sin of the whole world. And we don't know. We're in mortal time. We're only in the now. We don't know if one day they will be the Lord's. And he knows that. Um, but I also hear uh, in between what you're saying, not to look at the sin, not to get hung up on the sin, whatever the sin is, but to love the person because God loves them. Yes. Amen. Yeah. Amen. They're so precious to him. And um, mm -hmm. you've, you've had a lot of people come and sort of tell you their story or ask you questions after conferences. And I think you get a lot of questions from young people. And there's a lot of confusion out there uh, with young people. And I'm sure some of our watchers, they know some young people, maybe they're on our hearts. And I remember you saying, start with prayer, pray for that person before you even talk to them. Um, mm -hmm. uh, what, what are some questions that young people ask you or what are some things that maybe they might be struggling with and how can we help them as believers? Um, Concerning, I think, where you want to direct the questions to, I think young people ask the best questions because they ask questions um, that uh, not necessarily are about themselves um, in the sense of like when I when I go to conferences and, and it's, um, 
you know, for anyone, usually the adults will ask questions like, um, should I go to a same sex wedding? You know, what do I do with, with my children who identify as, as gay or trans? But kids will ask me like, you know, do you wish that all that bad stuff didn't happen to you? Or, you know, what's the greatest advice that you can give to someone through all that you've experienced in your life? But, but some kids will ask questions like, you know, so many people in my school are identifying as gay or bi. Um, how do I still have friendships with them without myself being tempted? Um, and that's a great question. And, and you know, kids uh, not putting them down in any way, shape or form, we were all there once ourselves, are just easily influenced because everything is new to them, right? I'm just an old dog. You can't even teach me new tricks now. So, so everything is, is new to them and they, they're still very much sponges and want to receive. And so, um, they're hearing maybe one, you know, I, I hear so many youth pastors say, well, I only give 20 minute message, 30 minutes top for my kids because you can't hold their attention. So they're getting 20 minutes of truth a week in a church or a building atmosphere back in the day when we went to church. Um, versus all the rest of the time in the week with TikTok and Instagram and not Facebook, because this is for just us old people that <laughs> like to argue about politics. But but of course, not you, not you who's watching. We know that you would never do that. Um, and whatever the, the younger people are on YouTube, big time YouTube subscribers. Um, you know, that's where they're being influenced and that's where they're going to find the answers to the questions that they're asking. So I will I will um, try to bring the kids into uh, reaffirming them that that Jesus is real and that he is the truth. And the Bible is actually a fun place to be um, if you if you take the time to read it, not just to read, but to read it, to find out who God is, because God's pretty cool. Um, and that if they would be willing just to take like one week off of every type of social media and spend that one week in the word of God and just, just one week and see if there's any, any change of heart or any dip, different type of temptations, not that they're tempted. I don't promise their temptations are going to, I just ask them if there's different types of temptations now and just to see, see what that does. And, and, you know, with, with young people who say, I've had young people come to me and say, you know, I, I have friends that are gay or bi, you know, I, I've watched porn and then it moved because I got bored with that type of porn. I moved into same sex porn and now I find myself attracted to girls or attracted to boys, whoever it is I'm talking to. And, um, you know, now I'm following gay YouTube, you know, I subscribe to gay YouTubers and what they say is kind of making sense. And it's, really love and why should it bother us that that you know if they're in a relationship together and now everything is just completely changed from that 20 to 30 minute message of truth that probably doesn't talk about homosexuality when they go to church on Sundays or, or youth youth um, uh, youth group night uh, versus what they're being inundated with um, online so I just try to let them know that culture will always change and that the culture five years ago um, is different than the culture now. And that when they graduate high school, the culture is going to be different. And when they graduate college, they're going to look back on their junior high time and say, I can't believe these kids in junior high now look at what they're doing when they're only they themselves seven, maybe 10 years removed from, from that part of, of their life. And it seems so simple, but they, they get it. They come up to me afterwards and say, I look at my little brother and I can't believe the things that he's doing or, or the things that he knows. I would have never known that at seven years old. You know, I'm 14 now and the things he knows at seven, I barely just learned myself. And I'll be like, see, you know, see what culture is doing to you. So what do you want to lay hold of that's not going to change? And then they'll be like, God, I see that God doesn't change. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we just have to get back to the basics with kids. They don't need strobe lights and they don't need a really cool pasture and in, in, in a jean jacket or a leather coat with slicked back hair. They need the truth of the gospel. They need to know that God is holy and that 
he loves them so much that he has given us boundaries in with which to live to have freedom. And I'll explain to them about, you know, I think they learn visually because they learn everything on a computer now. I learn visually. So I'll tell them, you know, if you have a dog and you live on a busy street, you have no backyard, you have a front yard, you're not just going to open up your front door to let the dog go to the bathroom in the front yard because you live on a busy street and you love your dog so much, you know that he's going to run out in traffic and you don't want that. So the first thing you can think of is you, you, you pound a spike into the front yard, put a chain on it, connect it to the dog's collar. But now you see your dog just rolling around in a circle in the front yard and you tell yourself, what is the best way I can make say, make my dog the safest. And you know that the best way to do that is to put a fence around your front yard. So, so while you've, you've done this for your dog because you love your dog so incredibly much and you want it to be as free as possible, you've put boundaries up for its safety. And some dogs are gonna so appreciate that and run around and play Frisbee and catch the ball in the front yard. But there's gonna be some dogs that immediately run right up to the edge of the fence and longingly look out and wish they could get out in that road not even knowing that they're gonna get hit by a car. And that's what God does with us. He's such a good God that he has put up these boundaries so that we could be free in him. And there's some people that are gonna enjoy that freedom. They're gonna put their nose up against the fence and say, why am I stuck in here? And then I'll ask them, which one are you? And it makes them think. They might not be able to answer right then, but it makes them think. Doesn't it also seem like sometimes there's some pain behind those questions? I remember hearing from your own testimony that you went through, uh, was it gender dysphoria? And you you were really struggling in your own body. And it, you, you explained to me one time, it's, very, it's, it's a common thing for kids who are going through adolescence or your body's changing, it's very weird, it's kind of icky, you know? Um, but then, uh, you know, there's, oh, well, that means you're gay, you know, if you, and so there's all these kind of lies, there's natural struggles already that are happening in adolescence and then there's mm -hmm. these lies or there might even be some abuse there or there might even be a broken home behind that mm -hmm. just any thoughts on you know having compassion with young people or letting the holy spirit guide you as you share with them or absolutely absolutely and so if, like you're a youth group worker or if, if you're a teacher you're around have the opportunity to be around kids that are other than than your own there are some telling signs that you can look for um, with, with kids, um, sometimes with girls, it's more of a, a, a baggy clothes um, presentation or a, a more of a masculine way of looking or moving. Um, that can be an indicator that maybe there was an, you know, in, anything from inappropriate touching or maybe even a, you know, man ex exposing himself is, is abusive, you know, to, to something more drastic than that. Um, eyes down hard, hard to make eye contact um again overeating or under eating um there's there's different signs and so if you see that in, in in someone there are things that you can um time you can spend with them and things that you can ask them slowly um and and again praying beforehand god give me every spiritual gift i ask for the gift of discernment now or the gift of knowledge now as i'm speaking to to this child um because if there has been something that has happened, they need to talk about it and they need to have a safe place to talk about it, especially if something has happened to them and they've told their mom or dad and their mother or father has asked them to remain silent about it and never to speak of this again, which happens very, very often. They need a safe place to talk about it because again, that's that's a wound that is real and it's being covered and the Lord wants to, to minister to them. And then, um, you know, just encourage them that, that, you know, it's not their fault. Um, and then there are some churches do have, um, you know, counseling ministries, uh, restoration ministries, even if it's, you know, somebody a little bit older. Uh, I know my, my sister, uh, uh, Sandy Stoffer has a ministry called Beauty for Ashes. That's a, a restoration ministry for women who've been sexually abused, physically abused, um, gone through abortions. One out of every three women in the church have had an abortion and one of every three women in the church have been sexually molested and and sometimes those go hand in hand uh she is you know shared with me that many women that she's counseled that have had an abortion have also had some type of sexual trauma 
And so our churches are filled with people like that that need to be ministered to, including children. And so we need to start to have um, in a very uh, gentle way these conversations uh, within the church so that God could bring that healing. But so for me, um, you know, with with the gender, uh, I thought being uh, expressing myself uh, in any way, shape or form feminine would cause me to be uh, inappropriately touched by men again. And, and I didn't want that as well as um, hearing my mom kind of get a daily beat down verbally um, made me not want to be a woman because I didn't want to be beat down verbally. I was already being beat down in another way. I couldn't handle it this way as well. And so I started um, feeling, you know, this is all hindsight. You know, I wasn't, going, you know, I, I think all this is going to add up to me being gender gender dysphoric as I get older. It was just, I was, when I was that little, I was just trying to get through the day, literally thinking that I was a boy because looking back now, one of the things the Lord showed me is when those times of being touched inappropriately sexually, um, I would tell myself, I would make, I made a vow in my head. If I could just become a boy, this would stop and so I didn't realize that that I was doing that in a sense. And so I kept that within me and I just kept uh, in my heart thinking, just become a boy, just become a boy, just become a boy. And so that's how I literally felt on the inside. So so there's there's some young people that might have gender confusion that are experiencing things like that. But then there's also many that are doing something that's just called trans trending. And they're they're tired of being mocked for the gender that they're in. So they're just going to try a different gender because why not? I mean, we're living in a society now that is telling everyone, create your own identity. You know, you can give yourself a new name online. You can cre create a whole new online world through anime, through, you know, the Bitmoji or what those things are called. Create a new online name. You can make yourself create a person to look the way you want to look it can be male or female or a, a, dro a dronage a, say it for me a, a dronage not male or female a dron a dronage i can't say it it's like vulnerable i can't say that word. what Androgynous. thank you yes that word that christmas will say and i'm not going to try to attempt again you know so um, we have the demasculinity of men, the defemininity of, of women all across the board. So, of course, our younger people are going to be confused. So we can't, you know, beat them down or tear them down for that. But we, instead, what we can do is encourage them where they are. Like for someone coming to me when I was 10 years old saying, put down that baseball glove and put on a dress wasn't going to help me. But if someone would have said, you know what, there's some really amazing female athletes that that um, you know, let's well, there was no like Google back then, but we, let's go to the library. Let's ride our horse and buggy <laughs> to the library and and look up some of these really good female athletes and encourage me in the things that I like, while at the same time in letting me know it's okay to be a girl. And if that happens, over eighty five percent of the time, statistics show that a young person that is gender confused pre-puberty, once they go through puberty, when they get to the other side, those things fall away and they become more comfortable in their own gender. But if we're not confirming them in that without trying to change the things that they enjoy, then it becomes a little more difficult. Or a young man that wants to sit and play the piano instead of going out and throwing the ball. Well, if dad or big brother or, or Uncle Joey comes, even if he's a football coach and says, I know nothing about the piano, but I love listening to you play. Will you play me another song? Oh, that's a great song. Will you play me another song? Hey, I got tickets to this show. Let's go. You know, and then talk about some really awesome men that happen to be amazing musicians. You know, and, and so encourage them in what they like while at the same time encouraging them in their own gender. And, and, and this is not confusing the issue. I remember, I remember talking about this before, and you said, be a safe place for the young person to go. They have all these questions. I mean, it's a confusing time, so be a safe place. They can come and talk about anything, but then also not confusing the issue. Masculine is not piano or hunting or, you know, and, and what do we always have to give everyone? Jesus Christ. 
Amen. Just being able to bring whoever it is. And I think sometimes people are intimidated. Oh, I don't know what that struggle is like, so I don't know what to say. We know Jesus. So he's the answer for everyone, right? Exactly. And like when I have friends that are, you know, maybe having um, uh, pain over a wayward child, I don't have children, but I can still minister to them and say, you know what? I'm sorry for what you're going through. I love you. Can I pray for you? You know, I'm not going to be able to say, well, this is what happened when my kid went through this. They have other friends for that, but I can love them right where they are and, and hold them and pray for them. So we're going to, uh, we're going to talk just a little bit about your website because it's such an amazing resource. There's so much on there and you just keep adding more and more cool and helpful stuff to it. Um, and then we're going to take three questions at the end. Okay. So Patty, tell us a little bit about your website. It's out of Egypt Yes. So, um, yes, I have it designed. I, I've a friend of mine, one of my board members, a, a pastor friend of mine, um, I had a great, great website and I just kept adding new videos to it so that there, you could just go there and find anything, but he helped me streamline a little bit. So when you sign on, um, the first thing you'll see is just my story, just like a quick little seven minute interview. Um, but then, um, the second, the second block down or if, yeah, if you click on either my story or no, no resources, um, you'll get to hear my testimony. And then the next video after that is a two hour and 15 minute video that has my testimony, what parents can do when their kids come out, how to reach the LGBT community, and then a time of, of Q&A. And I actually have, um, when you look at it, I have the times broken down. So if you've heard my testimony and you just want to go to a certain thing, you can fast forward to that time. And then I think there's a message that I gave to <clears throat> the whole body of Christ, I think on gender. But then if you click, um, uh, when you look at the website in the top right hand corner, those three lines that I've told are called pancakes. You click on those three pancakes and it'll take you to another place where you can get um, some of my uh, blog stories. I have to look now to see what it is. You um, have some good, uh, you have blog posts and you have some really good questions like is homosexuality a sin? And you talk about that. Uh, can someone be a gay Christian? And you have some really good insight into that. Uh, what the Bible says about homosexuality, and, and you've got some great articles there. Yeah. So I, I, yeah, I wanted to have, I wanted to have a place where people could go and and be, because I, I, as much as I would love to talk to every single person that reaches out to me, I, I simply can't. So I want them to have a place that they can go and hopefully find the answers to the questions that they have. So. Um, um, like extra media, if you click on extra media, there's more messages there, some for youth groups, uh, stuff on gender there just for youth and young adults. But there's also um, counseling resources that I now have. Um, and uh, if, if you're to pull it up, the first thing you're going to see under counseling links is uh, Restored Hope Network. Um, and that is like the umbrella. A network that you can call them or get a hold of them and say, this is where I live. This is what my needs are. Can you tell me if there's a ministry in this area? And then where it says counseling organizations, um, these are organizations that I trust that you can reach out to that actually do counseling one on one with someone who has um, unwanted same sex attraction or gender issues or you're a parent that wants to know how to minister to your child. Um, they will uh, counsel you, walk through this with you. Um, they have parent groups where they get together once a month and all the parents kind of talk kind of like on a Zoom thing. Um, uh, so it's really, really helpful. So someone, you know, to a parent whose child just came out six months ago can glean from someone who's been walking with their child for 10 years, um, the do's and the don'ts, what worked and what hasn't. Um, and then uh, under transgender, these ministries or the two, top two are ministries help for families um, is uh, Denise Sheik um, runs this ministry. Her father is transgender. She's written a few books. It's a fantastic ministry. Please go to that website and read some of her books. Very, very helpful. And then Sex Change Regret is with a man named Walt Heyer who lived, he had sex reassignment surgery uh, back in the 80s, I think, 70s, 80s. Um, and um, he has an amazing life story of how the church left him right where he was. And there was a couple of churches while he was a, a, a male to female, MTF, 
So a trans feminine or trans female living fully as a woman, but wanted to come back to God and wasn't ready to give up the dresses, so to speak yet, but wanted to, to learn God. There's people that invited them, him not only to their church, but into their home because he had lost his jobs for identifying or becoming transgender. And they never once told him stop being transgender. They just poured the love of Christ into him and God did the work. And that's what we have to remember. We're not called to fix people. We're called to bring people and point to people to Jesus Christ. So that's what sex change regret is. And then parents of um, ROGD kids is uh, ROGD stands for rapid onset gender dysphoria. And that's happening massively um, across our, our country. This, this is you know, predominantly a, a ministry within the United States. But you can talk to other parents and get really good information there on what rapid onset gender dysphoria is and, and how to um, speak to your kids about it and helpful, helpful, helpful things along the way. Awesome. I, just want to, I just want people to be equipped. And so that's what the website is, is for. And there's a link to it here. Um, and then it's also out of egyptministries.org if you all would like yes. to check that out. And I do recommend starting with Patty's testimony because it's so powerful. Um, and now we have three questions. Okay. Patty, from our watchers. <clears throat> so the first one is a, a young lady asking, uh, how can I respond to someone who says that I'm just being intolerant and I don't know what I'm talking about? Um, I would just respond to Sam. Well, thank you for sharing your opinion. Um, how would you like to continue in this conversation? Mm. I mean, people are trying to engage us so that we will argue. And remember, in 2 Timothy, I, I'm thankful that that's where the Lord had me start. Because 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2, verse 24 says, And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all. And you can just simply say, I feel like you're trying to engage in a conversation that is going to lead to an argument. And, and that's not really who I am as a disciple of Jesus Christ. So either rephrase the question or let's just stop this conversation. If you want to ask me questions about the Lord, about God or this God that I believe in, I would love to answer those questions for you because I know a lot more about God than I do about homosexuality or gender issues. And if you want to continue in this conversation, I'd love to hear your story, um, you know, of, of who you are as as a person, you know, if they identify gay or trans or whatever. Um, and I would I would love for you to teach me about that, you know, and then I can teach you about my Jesus. Um, but to say that I'm intolerant um, just starts off on a negative. And you wouldn't want me to say that you're intolerant to, to my identity, my personhood, which is a person of Jesus Christ. And so it's kind of offensive to me that you're saying that to me. So either let's just stop or start over. You do not have to engage in conversation that's going to end up in an argument. And I, I, I think that, that we feel like we have to defend our, our God and defend our beliefs, but we really don't. Our life def should define and defend our beliefs in Jesus Christ by the, the tenderness and the kindness and the strength and the truth and, and the power that we have in the Holy Spirit. Um, and, and so I, I know that might not be the answer, uh, that you're looking for whoever wrote that in. I appreciate that you did, but the, the, the time of getting in arguments with people, I think is, is long over, yes. um, you know, and, and be just like, if you want to call me intolerant, that's fine. But I'm not that I find that to be abusive and I've been abused enough in my life. I'm not going to let you abuse me anymore and just stop there. It's time to stop with people letting us, letting people intimidate us by that. We have to rise up in the in the gentleness and the power of Jesus Christ. There's no oxymorons with God. He's there's no one more powerful than God. And yet, have you ever met anyone more gentle? No. And so, so we can we can be the same. We walk in the power and the strength of the truth that we carry with the gentleness and the kindness, the grace and the humility of Jesus Christ. And if people come and ask us or say statements to us like that they're just looking for an argument and and we, we need to stop letting them intimidate us like that and i like what you said we we don't need to fight with anyone we don't have to fight mm -hmm. with anyone i was just reading about when um 
they came to take Jesus in Gethsemane and Peter jumps and he slices off Malchus's ear, you know, and Jesus, put your sword away, you know, but that, um, uh, that's not the way he does things. Somebody once said, we need to fight the right enemy with the right weapons in the right way. And Amen. To love so I just share that grace and truth. Amen. Amen. So I just, cause again, I'm visual. I just pictured when you were saying, you know, Peter with the ear and you know how Jesus healed him. Jesus like picking up that ear and in his hand going, I love you, Malchus. And then putting the ear back on his head. <laughs> Our second question. Talk about piercing an ear. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So our second question, there's uh, two parts to this question. Okay. Are you no longer attracted to women or do you just abstain from acting upon it? The second part of the question is, what is a Christian to do if they have prayed and begged God to take this away from them, but it hasn't gone away? Okay, my brain gets very distracted. So I'm just gonna, we're gonna have to make those two questions into two questions. So the first one is, am I attracted to women still? Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> I love women. Women are awesome. And I'm so excited that I can be attracted to women the right way now. That my pain and my brokenness that God has healed has taken the sexual attraction part away. Because I was so intrigued by women um, before because deep inside I really wanted to be a woman but I, I felt like I wasn't, or I couldn't measure up if, if I was, or I'd be what man would ever want me the right way because I'm so boyish in my mannerisms or how I look or whatever. So I just stuffed and stuffed and pushed that down and yet was still so intrigued by women that it became always became sexual for me. So now the fact that I, I know how to be attracted to women in a godly way, or maybe would say the same way you are, um, is amazing. So absolutely, I'm still attracted to women and I love it, but it's a godly way and it's no longer a sexual attraction, but it's not because um, it's not because God said it's wrong. I'm not not attracted to women because God says it's wrong. I'm not attracted to women in that sexual way anymore because God has brought me healing. And the second part of that question is, what if a what is a Christian to do if they have prayed and begged God to take this away from them, but it hasn't gone away? And that's a great question. And that's where most people start. And um, might I suggest you, instead of praying, asking God to take it away, maybe just come before the Lord and say, okay, Lord, I've prayed for years for you to take this away and it's still here. Lord, I'm going to ask you instead, you know, I love you, Lord. You know, I want to live my life completely sold out for you. I want you, Jesus. I believe you're true. I love you. I believed you died on the cross and rose again, died on the cross for my sins, rose again on the third day, uh, uh, ascended back into heaven and you're coming back again. And I know that believing that in my heart makes me saved. But yet here I am with the same sex attraction, Lord. What do I do with it? Lord, will you minister to me? And still meet me in all of who you are, even though I have same sex attraction. Lord, will you show me how I can walk with you and give my life to you and take up my cross and follow you, even though I have same sex attraction? Lord, will you show me where it started, when it started, how it started, and why it started. Oftentimes, it starts with porn. So for those people that are like, well, I was raised in a Christian home and I was never sexually violated and I have a good relationship with my dad and I have a good relationship with my mom. You know, where did this come from? Generally, if, if I'm talking with them and, and have time with them and we go back, it comes to a, a point either where there was a point in their life where they felt really rejected or they were introduced to pornography, whether by their own means or by somebody else or by accident. Um, or, or they, in sometimes even watching TV now is like pornography. Listen, our eyes were not meant to engage in the things that we see. So you can be an eight year old or a 10 year old and your parents might be watching law and order SVU. 
thinking that it's okay and you're sitting watching TV now or maybe you're not watching it. Your parents are thinking you're in bed, but you're sitting on the stairs watching it because you can't sleep. Not thinking that you're doing anything wrong. And now you have these literal pornographic images coming into your head at, at a young age and your, your mind and your body simply don't know how to respond to that. So you might be sitting thinking, but I've had the best of the best of the best parents and the best life and I still have same sex attraction. There's something there. It, it started somewhere and for some reason, take that prayer and say, Lord, will you, you, God, you are powerful. You see all things, you know, all things, you are aware of all things that concern me. Well, but I don't know these things. Will you show me when it started, where it started, how it started? And with that, when I, when you reveal these things to me, show me what to do with them. Because when God gives us the knowledge of things, then comes in wisdom. He gives us the knowledge of what is going on and then the wisdom of how to respond to the knowledge he's given us. And that's what he's, he's done with me. So instead of asking over and over for God to take it away, ask him to meet you in it and to walk with you in it for however long it's there. God, you know, a lot of people that are gay Christians will say, you know, I prayed, I prayed the gay away and it never went away. And so it must be that God made me this way because God, certainly God doesn't want me to be alone the rest of my life. Well, well, none of us want to be alone the rest of our life. Even if you're heterosexual, there's no guarantee that you're not going to be alone the rest of your life. So, so we can't, you know, it's like people will say, well, I don't want to be treated than anybody differently than anybody else. But yet sometimes you want to be treated differently than, than everybody else. And so, just lay it all before the Lord. And is it is it a hard walk to walk with the Lord when you have same sex attraction? Absolutely. Because they're, you know, for people who have heterosexual attractions but aren't married yet and are keeping themselves as the word of God tells us to, it's hard for them as well. But there's this there's a hope. There's a still a hope. Well, I might meet someone that I'm attracted to. And we might end up getting married someday. And someone who has same sex attraction doesn't necessarily have that same hope. So point your hope in something different. Point your hope in some point your hope in a God who promises to set you free. A God who has delivered us from power of death. I mean, that's a pretty big thing to rejoice in. Our sins have been forgiven and we will never die. And if you can't rejoice in those two things, then even if God gives you were to give you what you wanted, you might not be able to rejoice in that either. Learn how to rejoice in the things that you have that are good so that when maybe times of, uh, of, of living sparingly like we're in now, we can still rejoice in that as well. It, it's hard to rejoice now. I'm an extrovert. I'm type A. I'm an extrovert. I touch people all shoulder, head, back, everything when, when, I, when I'm with someone. It's hard to be in this time of quarantine now but am i rejoicing you bet because my sins because god is real my sins are forgiven and i jesus took my death for me so i go from life to life and i can rejoice in that and that's enough even if i attraction, and there were seasons in my life <laughs> that i did when i was going through my phases of healing over my sexual trauma there were times I wanted head head straight back to the to the gay clubs, and I knew I could hook up that night. Wanted to get wasted and wanted to to have sex, but I I cried out to God instead and said, "God, you know this is what I want. Make me want you more right now, because right now, I kind of it seems as if I want that more than I want you, but I give you permission to change my heart to make me want you more more than I want this right now." And there was seasons that that lasted for a little bit, and it was hard. But you got to ask yourself, are you willing to go through the pain to get to the promise? Are you willing to go through the pain to get to the promise? Because there's always the promises of God are yes and amen. And if you are whoever wrote this question, if you're writing it because you're experiencing this, don't give up. Don't give up. God, you are so intimate with God because of your struggles. All of us, whatever our struggles are, the intimacy that we have with God through those struggles are a beautiful thing. So um, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. 
And especially if you're a young person, you don't know what you're going to be experiencing five or 10 years from now. So don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. And I think that's a good reminder to anyone struggling with any temptation. Just ask God to help him help you love him more. So our last question, uh, uh, this person is asking how to respond to somebody else. And it's a delicate question, it's a delicate situation. What is a good response to the gay couple that says, quote, why would God want me to walk away from my husband or wife? I love him or her. Uh, this person knows that leaving the things we love is part of carrying the cross, but they also feel like this is a painful situation and it needs to be treated delicately and with love and respect. So what would you say? And because that was a long one, I'll say it again. Okay. How would you respond to the gay couple that says, why would God want me to walk away from my husband or wife? I love him or her. Okay. And yes. And, and what a beautiful heart that it seems you're expressing to, to want to be tender and, and kind to them. And, and yes, just acknowledge, acknowledge that. Yeah. You know what? I can't imagine what it's like to be in that position. That would be a really, really hard thing to do. But I want, you know, as if you're talking to them, I want to ask you this. Is God calling you to walk away from the person that you love or walk toward him with every decision you make? Every decision is either a yes or a no. Yes, Lord. Or no, Lord. And walk toward him. Start walk, walking toward him as a couple, as a couple and see what God will do with that. You know, and just then we have to trust the Lord enough that if they truly start walking toward God, that he's going to convict them. You know, and we're not going to tell them that, but that he's going to convict them right where they are each and every step of the way. And isn't that true with us? The, the things with which the Lord convicts me with now are not the same things he convicted me with 17 years ago. I wouldn't have been able to handle those things 17 years ago. I was still milk. I wasn't meat. You know, and, and so just assure them that you understand, yes, it's it's probably hard. It, you know, do you do you want to walk in this relationship with the Lord? So each of you are individuals. Walk walk toward the Lord as an individual, and then you know, go go watch things online or whatever, you know, together and just see what the Lord will do with you. We have no idea what God has for those who walk with him and love him. Now, I don't know if I would say this to them, but just so whoever asked this question can have a better understanding. Um, you know, I truly thought that I was in love with the girlfriend I had when I got saved because she had a part of my heart that I had never given anyone else before. I didn't understand there were other parts of my heart though, you know, and, and so, and then as I was sharing that I didn't, because I felt so less than as a woman, I needed to feed the deep down desire. I had to be a woman that I didn't know was there. That was the part of the wound that I had covered. Um, I needed to glean off. I needed to <laughs> glean off other women what I couldn't have. But in, in Romans, going back to Romans chapter one, um, oftentimes we just, you know, we look at verses 26 and 27, which, you know, talk about, you know, even their women exchange the natural use for what is against nature. And then likewise, the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust for one another. But if we look at the verses before that, because we always want to take God's word into context, um, you know, we, it talks about for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen so that nobody has an excuse to not believe in him. And then, you know, it's talking about, you know, professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man. And then it says that, um, you know, they exchanged the God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. And, and so to me, um, and then, you know, it's talking about we worship self, basically the creation. We worship the creation, all of it, instead of the creator. And then he gives an example. It's an interesting example of what God gives in his word of how it is that we worship the creation. And so the epitome of self worship is being intimately in a relationship with someone that's just like self. That is the epitome of self-worship. Sex with someone just like self 
is, is not love, it's self-idolization. And it doesn't bring God glory. It doesn't bring new life in. We were created for his glory. We were created to worship him. The first commandment is to be fruitful and multiply. And, and that doesn't happen in, in same-sex relationships because it's a self-love. It's loving someone just like self. And so while I felt like I was in love with my girlfriend, it was really a, 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 a self-edification type of love. And so that after we both got saved in all these years, now I can love her as I love you as a sister in Christ. And it's not a self-gratifying love anymore. It's a Christ-honoring love. I remember from your story, you and your girlfriend um, went to Calvary Chapel Old Bridge and people just welcomed you. They and did. Just, uh, and I, I, th I think and we were screaming lesbian couple when we walked in. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we weren't, you know, touching each other or holding hands or anything, but we looked like what people would imagine a lesbian couple looks like. And I, I remember you saying the first Sunday you were so touched by the love of God, especially during the worship time. And that was what you needed to encounter that first Sunday, wasn't it? Just the love of God. The love of God, the love of God. Nobody looked at us, either nobody did or the Lord protected me from seeing it. Nobody looked at us like, you know, with the, with the look of like, why, why are you guys here? And week after week after week of that, people didn't, people just loved us. I mean, it was the third time that we went to CCOB that, that we ended up getting saved the same day. And so people saw us grow. But even in that, I mean, we were always together after that. I mean, we still lived in the same home. You know, we wake up and, you know, in separate bedrooms now, but wake up, it's like, yay, we get to go to church again today because we went pretty much every time the doors were open. And, and, you know, I still looked very, very, you know, masculine. I only had boy clothes. And, and so, you know, they didn't say, are saved now you, you know you, you got to move out you got to grow your hair you, you got to change your clothes come on let me take you shopping they let god do the work they just loved us right me right where i was and encouraged me when i needed encouragement and and um it was it was a huge part of of my uh, growing in, in my walk with the lord was was the people from from ccob and many of them i still have in my life and i'm so thankful for those friendships. And I'm thankful for, for Pastor Lloyd Pulley and, and Karen Pulley, um, you know, being patient, me patient with me through, through all the years as well. Oh, we have one more question. Do you feel okay. like one more question? Sure. Sure. Okay. You want to know when my birthday is so you can send me chocolate? Is that the question? <laughs> That's the one. How did you know? That's the... I knew it. I could, well, you know, I asked for that, those giftings before we started talking. So, <laughs> um, the whole question, looks like it cut off. My sister is gay, has a wife, yet she has been saved at the age of 19. She's now 52. How can I help besides praying for her and her wife? Um, yeah, ask, just treat her as if she is saved. You know, it's like whatever her name is, let's just, we'll call it Susan. Um, hey, Susan, you know, you guys have been married now for 10 years. I know things change in a marriage. How can I be praying for you guys? What are your needs? You know, what, Susan, what are your needs personally? Or what are you and your wife's needs? I, you know, I pray for you every day and I just want to make sure I'm, I'm praying the right things. And this, Susan, this is what I need prayer for. You know, uh, my husband or my wife or, you know, whatever, uh, just lost a job because of COVID or, you know, my kids are being a little cray cray. Could you pay for that? Pray for them. Or I'm not feeling well or, or my finances are tight. Could you be praying for me? I, I know you love the Lord and I know he hears your prayer. So would you be praying for me and come together in the things that, that you have in common? And if, if, you know, if she's walking with, or if she's declaring herself to be a Christian and talking about the things of God, then talk about the things of God and go through a book of the Bible together. I usually suggest first John. First John is an amazing book. I think to go through with people that say they believe in God and love God, but still want to continue in their uh, uh, own life the way that they, they think is okay. Um, I think first John is a great place to go to. Um, but if she, 
if you're saying that that this Susan um, got saved at 19 and really hasn't had much of a life with the Lord since then, then just ask questions like, hey, you know, bring it back. Remember when, you know, you were 19 and I was 15 and this and this happened? Like that was an exciting time in life. But then, you know, this changed for me. And, you know, I started walking away from, from the Lord. And, and then I came back because of this situation. Um, but you, I remember you got saved at 19 and then at 22, you got your first girlfriend and you seemed to walk away from the Lord. What was that? Did you think that you couldn't have Jesus and your girlfriend at the same time? Like we just kind of stopped talking about the things of the Lord. And I'm interested to know, you know, so tell me a little bit about that and just get her to, to open up and, and not say, well, it's wrong that you did that, but just let her talk. She has a story that's worthy of hearing because she's your sister and you love her and you care. But also these are the very things if she'll let you in. These are the very things that you can privately go home and pray for now and, and bring before the Lord intimately in prayer. So if, if she does talk about the things of the Lord, talk about the things that you have in common, not the things that, that separate you. And then pray to God about the things that separate you, that those are the very things that, that he would bring conviction to. Because I know that when I get together with others and talk about the things of the Lord, even once we say our goodbyes and, and go our own way, I continue thinking about the things of the Lord because I've engaged in conversation with it. So she might not be talking with her wife about the things of the Lord and you might be the only conversation that she has with God and it might spur her on to think about him more and more throughout the day. Amen. Amen. Patty, would you answer one more question? Okay. <laughs> um, this young lady's asking, how do I love LGBTQ without being awkward? Uh, Wrong signals or mixed signals or... I'm trying to think of something funny. <laughs> what are those? What are those outfits the kids dress up in and go to those conferences? Uh, never mind. I was trying to think of funny and I can't think now. Um, how to not be off? Read the question again, because now I'm just being silly. Okay. <laughs> You've been doing great, by the way. Thank you so uh, much. Uh, of course. Um, how can I love LGBTQ without being awkward? Out being awkward. Okay. Um, take away the acronym. <laughs> Just mm -hmm. how can I be with people without being awkward? Not let and they're not gay. They're not bisexual. They're not transgender. They're Bill and Sue and Josie and and Michael. People. Their their gender and sexual identity has nothing to do with them in reality because they're they're a soul there's there's a person inside there that god created for his plans and his purposes and um they're just you know we all manifest our bends in in a certain way and they're just bent that way and um if it's a big deal in their life and they want to talk about those things, it's probably just going to be exhausted for you to hang out with them if that's all they talk about is LGBT stuff. Um, but if they don't talk about it, you don't need to talk about it either and just live life with them. Now, if you're a younger person and you're only hanging around or you have a lot of LGBTQ friends in your life, there's a good chance they're going to start, you might start believing some of the idea, ideologies which they believe, which is a lot more humanism than it is Christianity. And so I wouldn't want you to get caught up in humanism, whether they identified as, as gay or not. Uh, humanism is a very slippery slope that a lot of our young people are coming into social justice instead of the, the gospel. And, and so be careful uh, if you're a younger person, but if you're, you know, if you have some years under your belt, some maturity under your belt, um, don't, don't be awkward because they're, they're gay. Maybe you're just awkward. <laughs> You know, and ask the Lord to give you strength to to help you in your awkwardness when you're out sharing with people. Listen, sharing the gospel is awkward in and of itself, whether the person you're talking with is, you know, whatever part of the world they're from, whether they're male or female, gay or straight. It's it can especially if you don't have the gift of evangelism, it's an awkward thing to share the gospel. It's frightening. Mm -hmm. I'll be talking with my sister's husband about evangelizing, and I'm like, Hey, Mike, have you ever done that? And he's like, Yeah. Like, did you, you know, what was it like for you? He's like, oh, I was so nervous. It was so scared. 
you know, so, so just live life with people. Let, you know, share the gospel with words and share the gospel without words. And if words are very awkward for you to share, then share it in, in who you are. You can, you can do this. You can, you can share the gospel by living a life with your spiritual wardrobe and um, your spiritual Colossians chapter 3, 14, it says, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long suffering, and then verse 14, but above all these things, put on its bond of perfection. So if you want to be perfect instead of awkward, put on love. And um, we need as a people, as a people of Jesus Christ, we need to start being known more for our love than for our um, things that we don't agree with. Patty, thank you so much for taking the time with us guys. today. And uh, what a blessing. Love your heart for people. Um, you know, you're always thinking about the person and those relationships and always encouraging us to have those relationships. And Jesus was like that too. So I just really, we really appreciate that about you. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, Patty's website is um, outofegyptministries.org. Lots of great resources on there. And uh, Patty doesn't do one-on-one -on -one counseling, but she has lots of wonderful links uh, for counseling and even for family members or uh, if you have young people in your life uh, who have questions. Um, and there's some great recordings of you too. Uh, there's one where you're speaking to a youth group. And yes. uh, so I love that, that if, if that's the, the angle that they need to hear from, just go and listen to that video. Um, right. And, and I actually, in, in COVID, you know, it's like, Lord, how do you want me to minister when I can't go out to the church? So I've been doing a Instagram live um, three times a week and someone, not me, someone's putting them on, on YouTube for me. So I've now as well. I think if you just do Patty Height out of Egypt Ministries and scroll to where it says you can subscribe, um, subscribe to my YouTube channel, and I've been going through First Thessalonians. Um, so if you just want to, you know, go there, it's pretty much Bible talk, but sometimes I throw in a little ministry stuff, so you can go check out some of those videos as well. All right, well, thank you so much, and if you've enjoyed the video, please like it, please share it, and if you'd like to read Patty's uh, story, the very first story that we had, um, you can just go to calvarymagazine.org, and you'll see a little icon that says leaving the gay lifestyle and that's patty's testimony thank you everyone for joining us today thank you patty for sharing with us thank you love you guys you too bye bye, bye.